I'm Sylvan. Hey, everyone. And Wes Maggio. What's up, guys? <laughs> and I think my first sentence got clipped off. So this is Levi Sim for <laughs> Photofocus.com. We are live for our photo for our photo focus Lightroom Hangout this month. And uh, I'm coming to you live from Logan, Utah. Right. Rob, where are you? I'm I'm at home, uh, New Hampshire. Excellent. And Wes. I am uh, coming at you live from sunny Bartlett, Illinois, just outside Chicago. <laughs> Excellent. Love Chicago. And later this week, Rob and I will be uh, trying to figure out some way to do something for you live from the Tetons in Wyoming, Jackson Hole. We'll be there shooting pictures and having a great time. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. One of my favorite exactly. places. And I've been checking. There's a webcam that looks right out over the Tetons, and fall colors is going, and skies are looking great, so it's going to be a great week. Yeah, my brother just got back from up there last night and said the, the maples are full color right now, so it should be really, really nice. And I, are there still any seats in that workshop, Rob? Well, if anyone wants to join, yeah. I mean, come on, we'll, we'll squeeze you in, but it's, it's pretty short notice. We start on Thursday. Yes. So if you're in the neighborhood, come on by. We'll, it's we'll going to be terrific. A uh, quick shout-out to one of our sponsors is songfreedom.com, and they provide music for us to use with our productions, whether whether it's a video production or a photography slideshow or a, you know, a, a wedding slideshow, whatever it is, they've got the best music on the planet to use for these slideshows, and it, it really makes them better. In fact, you might say it adds color to your slideshow. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, we get we we start off our workshop with a slideshow and end it with a slideshow, so it's great to have uh, some music that we can use in those kinds of uh, things. So excellent. And today we are talking about enhancing, finishing, magicifying your color in Lightroom. Yeah, on this first day of autumn here in the northern hemisphere. That's right. Happy spring to anyone down. Happy south spring in the north. south. Yes. Yeah. Great time for color. So Wes. Tell us, uh, introduce yourself first of all. Well, thanks uh, first off for having me, guys. Uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, my name is Wes, and I am from Wacom Technology. I'm sure many of the people that are that are joining us here today are familiar with Wacom. Uh, for those that aren't, we make uh, an input device. Well, what exactly is an input device? It's a means of moving your cursor around the screen. It's like a mouse, a trackball, a trackpad. And what it enables photographers to do is to get more control over their favorite retouching and enhancement tools in applications like Lightroom, Photoshop and a dozens of others. So um, I came here today just to talk a little bit about color, talk about um, enhancing photos in general, and uh, just really to hang out with Levi and, and Rob. We're excited to have you here. And, and anybody who's watching, be sure to, um, be, be sure to, to use the Q&A uh, button on the Hangout feed right there to ask us a live question. Yeah, and we have fact, a question already. we got a question. Somebody says, do we need to know the basics of Lightroom to take this class? Um, no, no, no. You can just it helps. <laughs> Not with me here. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Hopefully, what this class, what this hangout will do is maybe inspire you to to learn those basics. You know, there obviously the more you know, the better. But if you don't, if you're coming in cold, you can kind of just sit back and watch and see what's possible. And then, uh, I know, I know, Levi, didn't you have a? Uh, didn't you just publish an ebook on developing in Lightroom? Well, yes, I did. I believe you were a co-author on that book. Right? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, that book is only ninety-nine cents right now on iTunes or Scribd, yeah. uh, where you can you can read it. And that's that's a great introduction to all the developing tools of Lightroom. Yeah, and on Photo Focus, there's a whole Lightroom Learning Center that there's just all our past hangouts and just a ton of other all all free stuff up there. So go check that out, Laurie, afterwards. And You'll, you'll yeah, just just join us and, and get excited about what you can do, and that'll help you uh, keep going when you're struggling with some of the frustrating stuff of getting started in Lightroom sometimes. Yeah. Now, um, I, so going back to to Lightroom and, and to and to Wacom too. So Wes, can you maybe talk a little bit about why uh, how a Wacom tablet can help in a Lightroom workflow? Um, if there's anything that it's good to know or any tips that you might want to share that would show us show us what you're holding there, Wes. Oh, what am I holding here? I am holding this pen right here. This is the uh, <laughs> the magic. This is why it is that um, people would want to use a tablet in the first place. So to Rob's question, um, 
you know, really, when it comes down to enhancing photos, finishing photos, retouching photos, you know, you've got a lot of tools available to you in an application like Lightroom and Photoshop and so on. But at the same time, how you apply those tools and those applications to your particular images, it you know, kind of comes down to getting the most control out of them. And that's what a pen enables me to do. Um, you know, in its simplest explanation, an, an input device is a means of moving your cursor around the screen. I might have mentioned that a moment uh, ago, but what I mean by that is with a pen, you can do all the things that you can use, uh, that you can do with a mouse, but with the added benefit of, of applying pressure-sensitive control. And what do I mean by that? Well, for those that aren't familiar with a tablet, how hard you physically press your pen to the tablet will enable just how much of an effect you might apply. So that might seem kind of simple right there, but imagine being able to brush on saturation as much or as little as you would based on how hard you press your pen to the tablet. So the easiest way to think about this is like a pencil on a piece of paper. If you press really hard with a pencil on a piece of paper, that line is going to be really dark, or maybe it's going to be a little bit wider. By lightening up the physical amount of pressure of the pen to the tablet, you can lighten up that, that pencil stroke, or in this case, maybe a brush stroke in like Lightroom or Photoshop. So when you're using, say, the adjustment brush, for example, you get a lot more control when you're brushing on an effect. And you also get a lot more control because it's simply more natural to draw like this than it is to kind of move this puck across a, a mouse pad and kind of follow a line and kind of stay within the lines, if you will. So Yeah, I love that. I also love, um, I feel like, like the worst thing to draw with is a ballpoint pen because it's kind of on or off. You have to press hard enough to get the ink flowing, and if you're not pressing hard enough, it doesn't flow. And so there's, there's very little... Um, amount control. There's very little uh, saturation control with the pen. Um, and that's that's like using a mouse. It's on or off. Yeah, that's a great when analogy. I, yeah, when I'm using my, my Wacom pen, it's more like using a pencil or a, or like an ink pen that, that responds to pressure sensitivity and, and really makes a big difference. Plus it, yeah, you're right. It's just, it's more natural feeling. I love those things. Hey, Wes, maybe... Um Got something you can show us using the adjustment brush? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's, let's see some, some action. Well, you know, uh, let's see here. Let me, let me first share my screen. Get this going here. Okay, you should be seeing a screen in front of you, right? I think. Yep. yep. This singer right here with this kind of really blue tint uh, to yes. the image. You know, um, since this, this is about enhancing color, I want to I talk about color in general for a second here. Um, you know, when you're when you're thinking about color, you think sometimes about color temperature. You know, if something's very blue, it's considered cool, or if it's very warm, it might be. Um, um, if something's very orange, it might be considered warm. Well, color is a very subjective thing in a lot of ways, and and I thought, well, let me look at a couple different images that I have some color applied to them, or or should say the color they're they're. they're I don't know what I'm trying to say. Images that aren't necessarily <laughs> right or wrong, and that's what I thought about when I when I pulled up this image here. Uh, I can't think of the singer's name, but this gentleman uh, is with the Steepwater Band. I had the good fortune of shooting them uh, last summer, I believe it was, working with a project. Um, anyways, long story short, so you know when you're shooting a concert or you're shooting um, uh, scenes where you've got a lot of different lights, sometimes you're introducing colors that you wouldn't necessarily think of when you've sat down to shoot them. And that's what happened here, you know. So we've got various blue lights going on in the background, and you know, here's another image right here. You've got a mixture of two different lights. You've got this, you know, blue gelled light with uh, a little bit more of a warm tone. Perhaps it's just the the ambient incandescent bulbs that are in there that kind of warm up the guitar, or maybe it's just simply the angle of the guitar. So you've got two different colors kind of introduced here. And then uh, let me skip over that one and go over here and look at this particular image. So again, think like a concert for a second here. You've got a lot of different lights that are flashing and so on, but you know, you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily right or wrong, but sometimes you've got situations where you want to enhance color, you want to change the color. And if I go back over here, for example, let's just look at this image here. When I think about Lightroom, I make a lot of global adjustments, meaning I'll use my develop module to really modify the colors here. And let's just start with the, uh, with the eyedropper for a second here. You know, a lot of times you'll use the eyedropper to kind of neutralize your color or get a, uh, a lot of times what I'm doing with the, with the eyedroppers, I'm looking to remove a color cast or I'm looking to set the gray point or the midpoint. And I might think about something that might be a neutral gray and let's say I just kind of tap right here. I kind of remove that blue tone 
you know, and now it looks a little bit cooler, not cool as in nice looking, but it's a cooler temperature. You know, we get rid of some of that blue um, uh, in the face and kind of warm it up, but it also kind of cools things down outside of the image. And from there, I might, um, you know, maybe reduce some of the shadows there. I might uh, bring up the clarity if I wanted to make this a little bit more of a gritty photo. Um, I might uh, drag up the vibrance just a little bit to kind of add a little bit more of a, uh, a different tone, if you will. Now you can do all that globally with an application like, right, like Lightroom, but when it comes to enhancing images, for, for at least from my perspective, I do a lot of selective adjustments. So for that, I use the adjustment brush. And what that brush allows me to do is it allows me to brush on various effects or whatever type of enhancements that I'm applying. Now I don't really have uh, anything in mind uh, to brush on with this particular image, but when I think of uh, uh, an image like something like this, it was a gorgeous morning, I kind of ran out and I wanted to kind of capture some of these different colors. As, as Rob had mentioned, this is the first day of fall. I didn't even know that. All I knew is that the sun was shining. It was a gorgeous day out. So, uh, so I grabbed my camera and I took a little walk around this trail that's near my house. And I kind of had this thing in mind. I, I wanted to uh, get some kind of high contrast images with the sun's kind of entering in the camera. I uh, purposely got a little bit of lens flare down here. I really like the, the kind of unsaturated look in some areas, but I wanted to bring out some of the color in others. So I've got these really nice yellow tones going on, some of these wildflowers here, and some nice lavender tones right over here. But I want to introduce a little bit more color. So what I would do in a situation like this is first start off by adding a little bit of a, a little bit of a gradient. So I'm going to grab my, my gradient tool here, and I'm just going to drag from the bottom up. I want to lighten up the bottom of this image. I'm getting a lot of uh, desaturated colors because the sun is entering into my camera or entering into the lens. So let me just reset this. I'm going to double tap on my effects slider right here. Incidentally, I'm sorry, I, I kind of jumped a little ahead of myself. I hit the M key on the keyboard, and that brought up my graduated filter. If I, I love that shortcut. That's a good one. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a shortcut junkie, and so much so I, I almost forget the long way uh, sometimes. <laughs> I, I kind of take it for granted that not everybody knows necessarily uh, all the different shortcuts. So there's a couple of really key shortcuts that I use when I'm developing images. M for the graduated filter. K, which I'll, I'll get ahead, uh, ahead of myself again, K brings up the adjustment brush. That's one of my favorites right there. But uh, anyways, M brings up the graduated filter, and the reason why I brought this up is because I want to increase the exposure just a little bit down here, uh, down in the lower portion of the image, and then I'm going to go ahead and hit M again. That's going to get rid of that graduated filter, and I'm going to drag my clarity slider globally now, and when I say globally, I mean it's applying this to the entire image to the right, and now I'm going to go ahead and hit the K key on the keyboard. That's going to bring up my adjustment brush. And I'm going to drag my saturation slider all the way up. Actually, I had dragged it up before. And I'm kind of I'm, I'm stuttering a little bit here because I'm having to lean over. I've got this little strip uh, light box right <laughs> above me so I can so you guys can see me when I'm on screen. Right. <laughs> uh, and, but it's like casting a little glare on my screen. So I'm leaning over here, and I'm going to hit the Command or Control Plus keys on my keyboard. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit, not quite that much. Okay, I'm going to try to zoom in halfway, and it's if getting it, uh, so. Wes, in your top left corner of the navigator bar over there, yeah, you've got, you've got your your two toggle settings. One is set to one to sixteen, and that's why it keeps going tiny. And then the other is set to one to one. So if you want to change that, where am I? Where are you seeing this? At? You said top, top left. left. Yep, navigator. In my navigator. Okay. Yep. And then change that selection right there. So there we go. so fit. Yeah, fit is usually where you want to be. And then when you toggle, oh, so I see. You get to choose either one to one, or you can choose that one where it says one to one sixteenth. Gotcha. And that yeah. that's the one that you want to alter. So switch that one to like one to two. So it's zooming in fifty percent instead of a hundred percent. See, now that's exactly why I absolutely love. Love, love, love <laughs> these kind of hangouts because I learned new stuff myself. All right, so let's zoom in just a little bit here. That's good. So I'm at one to two, and I, what I want to do is I want to focus a little bit on some of these yellow flowers. So I'm going to toggle uh, one of the controls on my tablet. There's something called a touch ring, and it's a little ring on the tablet, and what it's going to enable me to do is adjust my brush size by running my finger around the ring. And if you look at the... Uh, adjustment panel over here on the right hand side. As, my, as I run my finger around that ring, you can see it's going to adjust the overall size. So you can see, if you'll notice, hopefully you guys can see that. I've got two different yeah. circles there. 
Yeah. So that's adjusting both the uh, the size of my brush. But what I want to do here is I want to adjust the feather as well. And I'm going to drag this feather up a little bit. And now you can see that the distance between the overall size of the brush and that inner circle is changing. That's did, you kind know, of, did, did you know if you do shift and scroll your wheel? If I hold shift and scroll my wheel, it's probably going to... Okay, so there we go. There you go. Yeah, see, I didn't know that either. <laughs> Thanks, Levi. I, I, know, I know this guy who can teach you how to use those Wacom tablets really well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I'm much better at than, than Lightroom. Yeah. But, uh, all right, so let me bring that size back down here. And I'm going to hold down my shift key, and I'm going to run my finger around that ring once more and adjust that feather. And now I'm going to focus on the yellow flowers right here. And I'm barely touching my pen to the tablet in some areas, and I'm pressing a little bit harder in others. And the reason why I'm doing that is I want to adjust the saturation more or less based on where I'm painting. If I press very lightly, if you remember that analogy when we were talking about uh, about a pencil, pressing harder, you're, bringing, you're introducing more uh, a more dark stroke, and by pressing lighter, it's a little bit lighter. In fact, so, Wes, if, if you'll press O on your keyboard, that'll show us... That's going to show the mask. There we go, mask, yeah. yeah. There we go. So if, as I lighten up the touch of my pen, it's going to be light. As I press harder, you're going to see that, that it's a little... It's very subtle there. The color of my mask is going to get a little bit more, a little more red. Right. Now, right now, I'm kind of focusing primarily on the yellows in the image. But uh, I'm going to hit O once more, and I'm just going to focus on the purple for a moment, and then we'll just toggle that on and off here. So you can probably see that that purple or lavender color is really oversaturating there. Yeah. Now, the reason why I did this, I, I dragged that saturation slider all the way to the right, is because I wanted to really show a difference here. Right. Well, That's what I like to do. What I'll ultimately do is kind of back off of it a little bit, and I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. There we go. All right, let me hit uh, Command minus. We'll kind of zoom back out. And I'm going to toggle this little light switch on and off for a second here. What that's going to do is it's going to enable or disable the adjustments that we just applied. Now, this is pretty subtle. Let me zoom back in so you can see that. So there's our oh, before. Yeah, there it goes. Oh, I'm sorry. There's our before. My screen's getting ahead of me. And... There's our after. Did I hit it? There we go. I keep leaning over here because it's, it's this, the glare of my softbox is right on that lower, <laughs> the right-hand lower side of my screen. Okay, so there we go again. Before and after. I really oversaturated it there. Now, it's not too bad necessarily, but a lot of times when you're, when you're painting in at 100% saturation, it's really over the top. Well, ultimately what, I, what I'll do is hit P. Hold on. Let me back up here. I hit P and that advanced to my next image. There we go. I hit O to bring the mask back up. And I'm going to show you the, the pin right here. If I were to tap, let me zoom in and move over here. If I were to tap and hold my pen down on the pin and drag to the left, you'll notice in the adjustment panel on the right-hand side that the overall adjustment, well, in this case I only adjusted saturation, is moving. So I can move the saturation I can lessen the saturation across the entire adjustment that I just applied by simply dragging left or right. That's cool. So any of the sliders that you've moved on that pin will be adjusted as you as you move that that uh, as you drag left and right across the screen. Correct. And That's and actually awesome. with it still with it still active. Now let's say I just adjusted the saturation, but you know let's just for kicks I'm going to drag the clarity slider. I'm, I'm dragging it all the way up just you know for kicks. Yeah. And uh, so we can see a, a big adjustment there. But you can see how much it really got a lot sharper there. So once you've brushed on the mask, then you can go back and you can adjust all sorts of different uh, types of parameters, that, whether it be exposure or contrast. And, and I'll just drag a bunch of these around here. In fact, if I drag the exposure all the way to the right, you can kind of see where I masked out a little bit there. Yeah. But so now you can go back in, you can fine tune your shadows, your highlights, contrast, clarity, and so on. And uh, Or if you want to kind of re re reset everything, just double tap on effect and brings it all back down. But again, the mask is still there. So now I'm just going to go ahead and drag that saturation back up. Very cool. Yeah. There we go. So a lot of the adjustments that I make in Lightroom, for me, in my particular workflow, they're really subtle. They're, they're a lot of, again, adjustments uh, that are selectively applied. Uh, I really like the graduated filter. I use that quite a bit if I've got a, an overexposed uh, or underexposed portion of the image. Uh, but otherwise, everything's selective with me. Excellent. Thanks, Wes. That's a great uh, tip. I'm going to give my screen back to you guys <laughs> for a second. 
one of the things I like uh, about using the tablet is I'm I'm a lefty, so I hold the pen in my left hand and then have my hand my right hand on the keyboard. Yep. I kind of use those two together, uh, and I find that just really boosts productivity for me. Um, and because of that, I tend to not use the buttons on the tablet so much, unless I kind of in a different position where maybe I have the tablet right in front of me because I have my right hand on the keyboard. But it's just there's there's just so many different ways you can kind of uh, you know use the tool to make it work you know in your own in your own workflow. So yeah, and and you know. Wacom's not a sponsor for us today, but we, we use these tools. I mean, we I have it sitting on my desk, and it's what I use all the time, and, and Rob as well, and, and uh, also Jack Larson in the comments uh, said that if you try it for a day, no matter how frustrating it may seem, after a week you'll never go back, and I believe Wes has a three-day challenge. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. Uh, it, it is a three-day challenge, and, and I've been with Wacom for a number of years, and um, I, I can't – it's not my challenge, not not, not by even a long shot, but uh, our support guys used to tell me this. They said, you know, when someone would call in with a tech support question and, and maybe they're not kind of getting used to using their tablet, what they would do is they would essentially challenge them. They'd tell them to put their mouse away uh, for three days. You know, put it in the drawer. Don't, don't unplug it. Put it in the drawer. Don't mess with it. And use your pen for absolutely everything. And for many years, I used to say to them, you know, guys, that's that's great. Sure, you know, when you challenge yourself like that, of course you're going to get used to it. But, you know, I always thought about it kind of commercially, and, and I said to myself, gosh, you know, they got work to do. They've got stuff they've got to get done. Um, you, you can't tell them, you can't challenge them that, you can't put that tall a task uh, in front of them. And uh, it took me a really long time to kind of overcome that uh, um that that philosophy and, and say you know what yeah you really do have to challenge yourself that way you didn't jump into a car and expect to be an expert driver uh, you know right off the bat when you're using a pen it's it's different than a mouse it works a little bit differently sure it moves your cursor uh, around your screen but if you pick up your pen for the first time and you start you know kind of scooting like this like you would a mouse you're gonna get really frustrated because a pen works a little bit differently it works in what we call absolute mode Meaning, where you put your pen on the tablet is exactly where your cursor is going to appear on the screen. So if you pick up and scoot your pen like this, your cursor is going to keep jumping back, and that can be really frustrating for some. Um, so once you've gotten over the habit of not picking up and you know scooting like that, uh, you're, you're home free. Cool. Awesome, awesome. Well, Rob, why don't you show us another uh, color finishing? Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go phenomenon. kind of go to the kind of the beginning of an image where, um, can you see my screen yet? It's coming. Let's see. Yep, there it is. All right. So oh boy. here's an image uh, in the Tetons. Excellent. Um, hint, hint. We, uh, <laughs> and one of, the, one of the most important things you can do for enhancing color is, is really just bring back some contrast in your image. And this one was, you know, I shot really, if, if you ever heard of shooting to the right, I mean, I really... You look at the histogram panel up here. Everything's kind of bunched over to the right, but if I turn on my highlight clipping, nothing's clipped. There's well, there's a tiny little patch of snow up here in the mountain. And snow is white, so it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not going to sweat that. Um, so there's a lot of data in there, but it's so low contrast right now that it looks very flat. Um, and the, so there's a couple ways where, uh, if you just looked at this on the back of your camera, you might think delete because right? <laughs> it just looks so so horrible, but I'm going to start by just adjusting my black and white point, and there's there's two cool tricks to know. Um, one is you can just, well, you can always just drag it until it looks good by your eye, but another way is if you hold down the Option or Alt key and then start to drag, uh, with the blacks, I'm going to drag it to the left, and as you see, the screen is very white because there's nothing clipped to black yet. It, there's no, there's no, nothing in the shadows really. But as I drag the black slider to the left, notice the histogram sliding to the left as well, and eventually that end of that histogram is going to start hitting the left edge, and now I'm starting to see on the image some blue areas coming in, which is that rock that's there. So that tells me now I've set my black point. All right, And it really the image is starting to look better already. There's even a quicker way than that that kind of gets you to that same point. So I came up with minus 61 on the blacks. I'm going to double click the black slider to reset it. Now if I hold down the shift key and double tap the blacks, it's going to do an auto adjustment 
and and do essentially the same thing I was doing manually, but it just did it automatically. Nice. Just on that slider alone, and it came out negative sixty-five. So I was negative sixty-one, negative sixty-five. You know, it's it's in the ballpark. That's so the whites. You can do the same thing. You can hold down the Alt or Option key, and I'm going to do the same thing where I want to find my white point. And as soon as I clicked on that, you saw that little patch of snow up in the top. That's lit up. Um, so with the whites, I might drag this to the left as well to try and t tone my whites down a bit. All right. I'll double tap that to reset. Again, I'm going to hold the shift key and just double tap. And it come up with a minus 14. So already, just looking at before and after here, it's starting to bring in some color. All right. Not, I'm not going to worry about shadows because it's so skewed over to the to the right that I don't really have to worry about shadows. And I think highlights are probably fine right now too. The next big thing is exposure, but I don't want to bring down globally exposure because I really want to be able to see our fishermen here. Where it's too bright is up here on the mountain, and this is where um, having some kind of local adjustments come in handy. And um, for me, I would probably start off with using the graduated filter too. So instead of reducing exposure throughout the entire image, I'm going to hold down the shift key and just drag. Now you can see the sun was starting to rise here, and that's uh, kind of the, the height of the sun was just starting to t touch these trees, and of course the mountain was was covered. But as I bring down exposure there... And the, the shift key just kept your gradient yeah. perfectly parallel to the exactly, top. Exactly, yeah. So the shift key holds it parallel, or if you're going left to right with the graduated filter, it would hold it perfectly vertical. Um, now I can bring down exposure just where I want it, which is really just in the mountains. Oh, that's gorgeous. And now all the color is starting to come in on uh, on the mountaintop and in the trees there. If I just did a global, if I just delete that and I come out of my adjustment brush, if I just turn down exposure that same amount, I'd get that effect up here, but now I'm way dark down here. So now, could I do the reverse and now brighten that up? Sure. You know, that might be another approach is do this global ad adjustment, and now maybe I can use a radial adjustment. Oh. I'm going to just bring that over. There was just kind of a mist on the water here. And so I'm going to drag this out. But instead of having the uh, effect outside, I'm going to click this invert mask and have it just be on the inside. That's kind yeah. of extreme. So let me fade that out a little bit. You can increase the feather, yeah. Yeah, and I can mask. dial that down. And so now I can come up with something like that. So he's kind of coming back. So. Just by playing with the tonal adjustments uh, on an image that's kind of flat, you can bring back a lot of color that's already already in the image. And I didn't even get into doing anything else for color-wise. I didn't even touch white balance, which is another right. easy way. So for this one, this is the as shot. If I go to daylight, I can decide if that's uh, what I like. As Wes said, color is very subjective. White balance is subjective. If I wanted it warmer, I can go to cloudy. That might be a little yeah. warmer than I'd like it. But anyway, you can kind of, uh, once you get that baseline for people who are just starting out with Lightroom, is go to your tonal adjustments first, do your white balance. That may be all the color enhancement uh, you need to get you where you want to go. And then you can start taking it further if you want to, either selectively uh, or, or even globally. So, I don't know. I don't want awesome. To... Nice. Hey, Rob, you, you didn't use that image to taunt me, did you? <laughs> Wes, I think that might have been when you were with us the last yeah, I, I think it was. I was kind of going through some photos, and I looked at uh, uh, some of our Jackson Hole photos um, uh, from last year, and I said to myself, oh, man, you know, Rob's going up there, and what a great time we had. Yeah. yeah. Well, next year. Next year it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've got a tip for you, too. Um, so this is, this is a picture. Oh, I've got to share my screen. Hang on. This is a picture I made last week during a job here in Utah for Utah State University, and this is this is my finished my finished right. color and everything on there. Wow. And oops, there we go. And this this is what it looked like <laughs> coming out of the camera. Sorry, my my bad. Didn't mean to laugh out loud. <laughs> I, like your, uh, I like your logo up there. <laughs> 
yes, this is customizable here in Lightroom. You can change your uh, identity plate. I couldn't think of the name of it for a second. <laughs> he has it all the time. Right. He always has it. <laughs> so this is this is the the picture that I got right out of the camera, and I like like uh, kind of the opposite of what Rob just did in that that fisherman photo. He shot to the right and kind of brightened everything up. I kind of I kind of shot to the left just a little bit so that so that my clouds were not blown out. But I also knew um, I also knew that that I wasn't totally dark clipping my my black areas. If I press J um, J in the develop module will show you your clipping areas and nothing's clipped here. There's no blue and there's no red for clipped areas. So that's cool. Um, and then this is this is the photo with just the brightness adjustments made, um, brightening, brightening the shadows and and brightening the whites to to kind of bring things up a bit. And now I've got some clipped areas, got the the clouds a little bright and the shadows a little dark, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, and there's there's three things I did for color in here as well. I did uh, I did some white balance and what did I set the white balance to? 66. 80. And so starting with that, I can dial that directly in. And I uh, that's that's not a magic number, that's just where it kind of actually I think I used the the white balance dropper on on part of the trim here on this building. And this is downtown Salt Lake City. We got up in in one of the adjacent skyscrapers. This is the city hall building down there. And it's just a pretty cool spot to go. The first place I came, though, to, to do my color adjustments is the camera calibration tab. This is my favorite secret weapon in Lightroom. And just turning on the adjustment there, can you see what that's like? There's off and there's on. How are you turning that on and off, Levi? I, I use the light switch just like you did on the, uh, oh, okay. I didn't on see the adjustment brush. I use the light switch here on the tab itself. And what I've done, the first place I always stop is the um, is the uh, ah, it's early over here. The saturation <laughs> slider for blue. I crank up the blues, and I do that to almost every picture I make, and it always makes the picture look better. And then it it, it not only adjusts the blues, but it also adjusts the red and greens. And then sometimes I also adjust red and green. And in this case, I did. Um, juiced up the saturation on the the red and green sliders a little bit to, uh, to add just a little bit more punch, but even just the blue slider really does a great job. So here is none. There we go. Here comes the blue. There's blue. Here comes the green. Come on, green. You can do it, green. There's green. <laughs> And here's some some red. Where's the red? You can do it right there. We go. <laughs> anyway, using these sliders really makes the colors um, more vibrant, and and I think it does it more gently than some of the other saturation sliders in Lightroom. If if I just use the basic tab saturation slider, the colors get out of control, and they're it really kind of clips the colors. Um, look, look what it did to my histogram up there. It, mm. I, I think it removes the, the, the range of colors, increasing the saturation. So instead of having red, red, orange, orange, and then orange, yellow, and yellow, you just end up with red, orange, yellow. And you, miss, you start eliminating the, uh, the in-between colors. Um, and then the other thing I did in this one was I used the hue and saturation sliders to, what did I do? I think I just increased the blue, yeah, the blue and the aqua. And um, I didn't I didn't say, oh, gee, like five points of aqua would look great with 20 points of blue. I grabbed the targeted adjustment tool from the corner, and then you bring that into the picture, and whatever you click on and drag up or down with, it, it adjusts the associated colors together. So if you look in my tab right there, you can see in, in my palette it says that I've moved the, the blues, but I'm also moving the aqua with it together. So it's primarily blue, but it's also got some aqua 
and that's much better than I could do just by moving the blues alone. If I move the sliders individually, it, it separates the colors and you end up with a lot of artifacting in there. So I, I love the targeted adjustment tool for that stuff. Very cool. Yeah, so that's my uh, that's my little like uh, fairyland <laughs> castle cool. tower. Now, how far away were you when you uh, shot that, Levi? Um, let's see. You said you were in. I'm, a, I'm across. Yeah. The, I'm in the middle of the next block across. So, just okay. a couple hundred yards. This is a 30 millimeter lens on a micro four thirds. So it's like a it's like shooting with a 60 millimeter on a full frame camera. Wow. So not very far. Nice. You wouldn't you wouldn't tell that. I mean, it looks like it's just kind of coming out of the woods. Right. Yeah. And and a lot of that I think is from the perspective. I was on par. You know, my camera's not tilted up or down. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm shooting pretty much straight across. So that was cool. Very cool. A lot of fun. Um, there's a there's a question in the Q and A that uh, I don't I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but maybe you guys can help. Uh, from Sam, do you have any information concerning Bayer filter interpolation and LED rather than gelled stage light? And Gee, what, Sam, that's uh, and Sam's a friend of mine. <laughs> He's trying to throw is, it. is it about is it about the effect of different lighting on the the anti-aliasing filter on a sensor? I'm I'm just trying to interpret what that is asking. I don't know if it's a temperature Bayer filter interpolation. Question. Yeah, clarify for us, Sam. Put it. Put in another question there. <laughs> so one one thing about LEDs is that sometimes they cycle on and off a little bit, whereas a gelled stage light is continuously on all the time. It's burning a filament that stays illuminated and doesn't doesn't have any um, any cycling, any on or off time with the with the power in the wall. Our our wall power turns on and off 60 times every second. And we can see that with some lights, like an LED light or a fluorescent light may show that. Um, in fact, I recently flipped out a little bit when I saw a picture I took with my, with my Micro Four Thirds mirrorless camera. And I took a picture under fluorescent lights, and there was all this banding. And it was like it was recording the, the cycling of the lights um, across this image. And it was, I was scared to death that this was going to be the the result that I get every time, because I, I, I shoot mixed lighting all the time for my commercial work, and I, I can't have that kind of banding going on. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 so I posted a, a question to a friend who shoots a lot, and he said it was just because I had the silent shutter turned on. Anyway, it's no problem now. Well, maybe Sam will clarify. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I was going to show something else, unless one well, of you guys wanted to jump in. Go for it, Rob. There we go. Um, one of the other... One of the other big impacts on uh, color is going to be your camera profile that you use. So this is um, Sunflower Field. I, I visited uh, a couple days ago. Our sunflowers are passing. They're all like they're kind of huddled up and uh, planning an attack here. But um, under the camera calibration panel, when you have a raw photo selected, if you have any other non-raw photo selected, you'll just see embedded. But if you have a raw photo selected, you're going to see some camera uh, stop matching, stop, some camera style matching profiles that Adobe created to kind of go with your camera specifically. I now, love these. I've got a bunch of other ones here that you probably wouldn't have unless you installed uh, a preset, kind of like a plug-in, but it's more of a it's a really cool set of presets from a company called Visual Supply Company, Visco. They uh, also have uh, some iPhone and Android apps, uh, camera apps, so it's pretty cool. What these Visco presets do is they're, they're really trying to emulate different film looks. And they do that through a combination of slider adjustments, tone curves, and that kind of thing. But what's really unique to these presets is that they also created a bunch of custom camera profiles to try and emulate that particular film style. Oh, that's awesome. And what's cool in, a, in that it's in a preset is when you roll over a, your cursor over a preset, you get a preview in the navigator. Now, I have my panel open as wide as it can be here. It would be great if we could make that bigger, but we can't. So you can get a, a, a kind of a sense of the effect of these presets by looking in the navigator as I just move my cursor over 
uh, these. And it really has a big effect on uh, the color as well as, well, here's, there's some black and white ones in there too, but um, the total adjustments too. So if I take away from those presets and just look at the ones that typically come with uh, any supported uh, RAW format, there's Adobe Standard. That's the, usually the default. Then there's the one for camera landscape, camera neutral, camera portrait, camera standard, and camera vivid. Those are the ones that you pretty much will find for any uh, raw, raw photo that's supported by Lightroom. Unless you shoot Canon, then you also get camera faithful, which is yeah. which is one good reason to shoot Canon. <laughs> that's one. That is the only reason. <laughs> that is the only reason. Um, so. Just for, you know, for example, the camera landscape is much more contrasty. It tends to really boost the colors up, a lot more saturated color, as opposed to neutral, where it's a lot flatter. These are all just different starting points, um, not necessarily the final image, but changing these is a good way to kind of get started by seeing what, what's potential uh, is in your image. Vivid is kind of like camera landscape on steroids, much more contrasty and much more saturated. But And any of them are almost always better than Adobe Standard. Yeah, and you know, it really depends on what your what your image is trying to say, you know, what you're trying to do and what what fits your taste. So you can see that there's a lot of different ways that you can start off an image just by changing this uh, this camera profile. Um, so if I then kind of take one of these presets and uh, use that as a starting point, let's see, one that's kind of, let me reset because I did change that. Um, one that has, let's see, what's my go-to ones here? You know, it just, uh, the other thing these, tend to bring in that I don't always go for, uh, and this is just a, a personal taste as well, but sometimes the Visco ones bring in uh, some grain to try and emulate that on the film. I, I usually always wind up turning that off. I'm just used to digital, but you know, if that's what you like, hey, that's fine. But, so if you ever use these and you want to turn grain off, just double click on the grain there and it just turns off the grain part. Um, the other part of the Visco tool set that is kind of neat aside from those presets, is they have some uh, a toolkit that comes with it that also affects color and grain and highlights and things like that. Um, and so just by changing some of these things, you can, uh, one of the things that you see a lot is kind of these uh, flat images uh, where they're kind of faded is one of the looks where you kind of have that uh, really low contrast look, fading highlights. And then there's one, another set that is on just for their color, where you can start to enhance greens, yellows. And these are essentially pulling in those same uh, uh, changes like Levi was doing in the HSL panel, where you want to try to just boost things in different increments. It's just another way to kind of leverage the tools that are in Lightroom. The benefit I find of using the presets is it's just getting this preview as you do it where you don't have to always um, kind of move the sliders back and forth to try and see if that's the, the look that you're going for. Oh, so nice. yeah. just by doing a few things like that, before I even got into making any other adjustments, um, you know, it starts to take the image to a different place. Um, and then I might, you know, just change the white balance a little bit to affect that sky a little bit more. And when I applied that preset, it did have some total adjustments built into it. And that's why we saw that uh, that change. So that's all I want. You know, there's a lot of different ways you could go with this image. I mean, this is this was one kind of way I took it. And, you know, you can really uh, bring out a lot of different color just by changing that changing that camera profile to start, and then going in and making your other adjustments for uh, white balance and tonal adjustments and, and HSL and that kind of thing. So Excellent. Yeah. That's the thing I love about about presets. They they give you a great place to start. You know, yeah. um, you know when, when, when we think about ourselves as artists or photographers or a writer or what have you, you know, that 
and, and Rob, you know, you're, you're, you're a writer, both you and Levi are both writers, you know, when you sit down and you've got that blank page and you're looking at that cursor kind of, you know, blinking at you, it, it can be pretty intimidating. It's the same kind of thing when, you're, when you think about photography. You know, you might take a photo and you've got a great composition, but maybe the lighting's not right or maybe the, the exposure's not quite right, but you need to do something. What do you do with it? Well, sometimes starting with a preset is a great way to kind of jumpstart your creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I like that. Well, that's cool. Um, can I show one then? Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Let's do. Uh, let's do something more with that radial brush. Share my screen. Entire screen. Share. Switch to me. There we go. Let's see here. Uh, on this. Oh, that's a bad example. Let me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no example. Let me get a good example. <laughs> uh, hey, my, uh, Jack is calling you out. Who, what's, he, what's he say? He says, uh, in your example, you used Adobe Standard, but then you said anything is better than Adobe Standard. Aha! <laughs> yes. Well, and you know why I used Adobe Standard? Because Adobe has not created any extras for us for, for the Panasonic cameras, for the GH4, the GX7. And it is my number one request from them right now to please profile these new Micro Four Thirds cameras because they are awesome. And the, the color, the profiles built into these cameras are really, really excellent. I, I think they're the best. I've, I've been shooting RAW plus JPEG because of it. And, and I've been using my JPEGs every time, which is a first for me uh, because they, they look so good. And so you're just you're just anti Adobe Standard for that reason. I I absolutely well it's it's too contrasty and it's too red. <laughs> Adobe Standard is, and uh, I much prefer to see see it the way I shot it. And so I usually have my camera set to neutral, and I shoot, um, and then I, I apply a, a preset on import to set it to neutral as well, okay. so that I don't lose any of those um, those great settings that I had. Yeah, and you know another thing, just to clarify for folks, if it's if there's confusion there, is that <clears throat> so Lightroom doesn't understand any style settings you might dial in the camera that pertain to those, you know, the color styles that the cameras come with, contrast, color boosting, sharpening. If you're shooting in RAW, Lightroom doesn't understand that, doesn't even pay any attention to it. So. What you see on your LCD is going to be based on the settings you have in your camera, but when it comes into Lightroom, you might see that nice, colorful, punchy raw photo all of a sudden be replaced by this really flat, low contrasty, dull looking image. And that's because Lightroom is just showing you the raw data and using its default settings. So it doesn't have a way to say, oh, you, cho you chose the camera faithful style in your camera, I'm going to display that. It doesn't. It doesn't know that. So you have to make that choice, and the camera, st the camera matching uh, styles, are Adobe's attempt to try and emulate those in-camera styles. They're not going to be true one-to-one, -one exactly the same, because Lightroom is using Adobe's camera raw engine to render this raw data. Your camera is using whatever proprietary engine is inside the camera software. So. There's potentially going to be some difference, but that's supposed. The intention of these camera profiles is to get you uh, closer to uh, to that starting point that you might have chosen in your camera. So, and in the case of Levi's Panasonic, maybe they haven't had the time uh, or resources to uh, emulate the styles that are available there. But sigh. Oh. <laughs> a good question, you know Jack. It, it, yeah, that's you should absolutely call me out on stuff like that because um, you had a good answer too. Yeah, well, that's that's the only reason that that was set to Adobe Standard because that was my only option. <laughs> oh well, let me show you something here. Um, using the radial adjustment tool for some uh, the radial filter for some local stuff, and to, the shortcut for that is Shift M, and then you can click and drag in here. I'm going to unhide this. Let me unhide. There we go, and I'll start again. And you, you click and drag, and you're making a, a circular or elliptical adjustment with this thing. And I, what I want to do is kind of juice up these things individually. So um, I'm going to increase the highlights on here. Oops, it just increased the highlights outside my circle because I didn't press the invert mask like Rob showed us earlier. 
and let's up this the shadows a tiny bit and give it a little bit of clarity and then something else we could do is like add a color wash over the top inside this thing if I wanted to really green those up look what that does that's yucky why would I ever do that <laughs> but but maybe with a little bit of, of warmth to them it'll it'll look kind of nice where is where is that Levi? That's this color swatch at the bottom of the palette. No, I mean, and where geographically? Oh, that's uh, that's Red Rocks Canyon outside uh, <laughs> outside Vegas. Ah, okay. Outside Las Vegas. We shot this at WPPI last year. Um, okay, so so here's without that. And I kind of like it with. You know, it's brightening it up a little bit. I like that setting. Let's just duplicate that. And now I've got a new button right on top of that. I can drag it over here. Maybe reshape it to fit my my new spot a little bit better, but it kept the same settings that I set at the other place, and then I could duplicate it again. And by duplicating, it it also just doubles the effect. And I kind of like it doubled right there. So let's just duplicate it again and drag that one over here and put it on these yucca. You know, something like this. And then uh, let's duplicate that one again. And once again, I kind of like that, so let's duplicate it a third time there and put it over here. Those guys. And so I really like the, the radial filter brush this way. Um, for a little bit, I was thinking, well, this isn't, it's the same exact adjustments I could do with the, uh, with the adjustment brush. You know, I could, just, I could just paint a circle with the adjustment brush. But then I can't drag that adjustment anywhere else in the adjustment brush. So this allows me to actually reposition this filter anywhere I want. And and that's a that's a pretty cool tool, really. Yeah. Very cool. Think. And let me take this opportunity to uh, throw out a rant. Um, yeah. I, really, I really want keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom. Uh, yes. You know, uh, customizable keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom, yeah. I should say. I know I'm not alone. No, no. <laughs> You're not. That's often not alone, often not alone at all. Yes, that would be great. Ooh, let's do this one. What would you customize right here, Wes? Uh, right about there. You know, obviously saturation is, is a big thing uh, for me um, without going too far over the top. A little bit of clarity. Um, obviously, if that's, if that's your subject, if you want right. to separate your foreground from your background, there's already looks like there's some nice detail in there. Let's get but this uh, there. I'm a big fan of clarity. So that action there. There we go. A little bit of highlights again there. Okay. Well, then let's have a look at our history, and we'll see what we looked like before we came in and started doing stuff. So there's the before without all those local adjustments for. And it's it's amazing how much the color is affected. Like Rob already, like both of you already said, is is strongly affected by non-color adjustments like the brightness and saturation and clarity really have a huge effect on color. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So I like that. Anyway. Yeah. I've got uh, what, you, you got know, another one for us? Since you're yeah, let me just kind of wrap up. I'm looking at our clock. I want to make sure we, you know we, we get a nice uh, assortment of different things in here. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, I'm a I'm an adjustment brush kind of guy. Um, let me get my screen going here. Um, hey Wes, while you're getting that going, is the yeah. pen Lightroom is the pen in Lightroom automatically pressure sensitive, or do I need to set it? It is automatically pressure sensitive, but you know, to you know, just to kind of set proper expectations. You know, we think about when we think about Lightroom compared to an application like Photoshop, and um, and actually, let me let me even back up for a second, even further than that. You know, I remember when when Lightroom first came out, we were talking about when you use Photoshop, this is how you integrate Lightroom into your workflow. Now, you know, fast forward <laughs> almost 10 years later, and we're kind of doing the opposite. You know, we've got so many photographers that started in Lightroom, and now they want to introduce a little bit of Photoshop into their workflow. You know, it, it's just kind of funny how we kind of transition the conversation, you know, one before the other. But but to get back to my original thought, when you're comparing an application like Lightroom to Photoshop, um, Lightroom is somewhat in its infancy. I can't say it's in its infancy anymore because it is getting a, a, to be a more mature application. But in terms of a tool set that specifically takes advantage of the pen and pressure sensitivity, Lightroom kind of pales in comparison to something like Photoshop. Now, by paling comparison, I'm not saying that it's not a, a great application to use. My workflow incorporates both applications uh, considerably. 
but what in, what Lightroom enables me to do is to make a lot of global adjustments and some selective adjustments using my pen before I take my images into Photoshop where I may finish more of them uh, there. But when it comes to setting up Lightroom, uh, you don't have a whole lot to set up because it is pressure sensitive right out of the box, meaning your adjustment brush is pressure sensitive. One of the downsides to it, however, again by comparison to Photoshop is you don't necessarily have all of the uh, the finite adjustments that you can make to the behavior of the adjustment brush. So all you really have to do in Lightroom is to go into the adjustment brush, so for example K, and now let me just kind of reset some of these things in here, is really kind of pay attention to the brush area. In fact, that's what I wanted to do, a talk just a little bit about how the, the brush sort of works, not necessarily in how it applies certain effects, but kind of how it works here. You've got, basically, when we look at the brush panel here, uh, you've got two different brushes, a and B, these are simply kind of like um, uh, kind of like presets for a brush. You'll notice that when I tap on A and I tap on B, the size, the feather, and the flow, they kind of change there. If you find yourself always using one kind of brush and an another, and another, not and and another, <laughs> but and another kind of a brush, these are just ways to quickly get to one or the other. So for example... Do you, do you guys use that? Do you guys use A and B? With the with the speed of of scrolling up and down to change the size and, and things, I I haven't been using it much. You know, I, I actually to be fair, I used to use it more than I do now. But yeah. uh, what I used to do is I would have one that's kind of a, a much bigger brush, one uh -huh. that's more of a detail brush. You know, not that you couldn't adjust either one of them to small or large brush, but um, that's kind of how I used to set it up. You know, in fact, if it's still set up that way, I've, I've since adjusted it quite a bit. So there you go. There, there's a perfect example where B would have been my uh, my detail brush, and A normally I would have that you know up like that, and so you could see there's quite a big quite a big difference, big delta between the two. So that's just a nice way of quickly getting from different size brushes or different types of brushes. Um, you've also got an erase function. So for example, if you've maybe made a global adjustment and then you wanted to erase that adjustment only in certain areas, yeah, you, know, you can click over here to the erase uh, option. Hey Wes. Yeah. Can does does a Wacom pen have an eraser? Yes, it does. Uh, you know, <laughs> wow, that's that's another one of those like you know, third dump shots right there. Uh, yeah. I don't, can you guys only see my? I think you can only see my. We can only see your screen right now. Yeah. Uh, let me let me uh, <laughs> jump over here just so you guys can see this here. Uh, let me stop uh, screen sharing. Oh, and, all right, so if you guys can see that info, I don't know how that might be a little bit blurry right there, but that little thing right there on the back of your pen, that's an eraser. Um, so you can flip that over, in some cases, and erase. In order for that eraser to work that way, though, the application has to specifically take advantage of it. And I've never even used it in Lightroom, so I couldn't <laughs> even tell you. But I don't think it does. I don't think it erases. Okay. Um, hey, Wes. Yeah. Can you, can you take in... In the preference settings for your for your pen and set different keystrokes to happen on that eraser instead of it being an eraser. Yes, you can, Rob. So, <laughs> so could you make it press the uh, Alt or Option key? You you could. Now listen, I want to be fair right here. You know, um, I work for Wacom and I want to sell more tablets, but um, you know, just like everything in life, there are features that are great and there are features that are cool uh, and there are features that are great in some applications. I honestly don't use my eraser. Yeah. You know, uh, but you can. Just, but, but just because okay. you can doesn't mean you should. I, I, have, my, I have my keyboards, my, my, uh, my button on the side of my pad, on the side of the tablet set up to alt key, so I just dial yeah. that one for yeah. yeah, you know, I don't, um, I, I, I haven't talked a whole lot about the tablet, uh, really, just because, you know, I don't want to make it about the tablet necessarily, but there, there's just a couple of things that I really find are, are beneficial. So, for example, um, let me share my screen for a second here so you guys can see a couple of things that I'm talking about. And I specifically didn't set this up so that you could see kind of how it's set up. But if, for example, I have um, just this image on screen here, if I hold my finger on one of what are called the express keys, you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen that this kind of heads-up display has appeared. This is called Express View. And it's basically a map of the different buttons that I have on my tablet that can be assigned common keyboard shortcuts and functions. So, for example, if you had some of your favorite keyboard shortcuts, let's just say, you know, I, I say K, for example. If I had set one of the express keys up, 
let's say the one that's highlighted that looks orange and it says display toggle, if I assigned that express key to the K key, simply clicking that button on my tablet would bring up my adjustment brush. Now, that's a, probably a bad example because it's pretty easy to just hit K on the keyboard. But uh, what I typically do is I look at some of the keyboard shortcuts that require multiple keystrokes, um, you know, two and three. Now, for example, um, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll set it up for maybe, uh, you know, again, perhaps a, a bad example, but the, the backslash key, you know, so I can toggle it before and after. Or if we look at uh, underneath view, what it is, what, it, what is it that I'm looking for here? Uh, let's see here. Sometimes I'll set them up for my copy before or copy my after settings. You know, so you can see oh, here that nice. there's a number of different keys that you have to hit, and I don't know if you're going to remember that it's command, option, shift, uh, you know, left <laughs> keyboard yeah. shortcut. Once so, I go beyond three, I don't usually remember that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is a, a perfect example um, of where you might want to uh, assign one of your express keys. Here's one that I use quite often, copy settings, you know, from one image. Like if I've got a, a whole collection of images, well, let's just zoom down here, Rob, and take a look at this string lake. Hey, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was wishing that I was going to uh, Jackson Hole this week, uh, I ran across some of these photos. So, um, you know, let's say, for example, I've adjusted this particular image, and I really like this, and it's really a lot of the same adjustments that I've made. As I go through this series, it'd be really nice if I could just copy and paste all of the different adjustments, all of the different uh, enhancements that I made. So I might apply that. I might, uh, I might program one of my express keys for that. So let's just uh, let's do that real quick here. I'm bringing up the Wacom tablet uh, properties. And where you're going to find this is going to depend a little bit about your, uh, a little bit on your operating system. It's going to look exactly like this once you get there. Uh, but for example, if I had added Lightroom to an application, to my application row, I'm going to click that plus sign. I'm going to add Lightroom, and I'll go ahead and click OK. Now, with the Lightroom icon appearing in the application row, any adjustments or uh, assignments that I make to my pen, or in this case, to my Express keys, it's going to apply only to Lightroom. So that's a really nice thing about Wacom's professional tablet line. You can assign common keyboard shortcuts to your express keys for all of your different applications that you use. So let's look at, uh, let's see here. That was, if I'm not mistaken, settings. Uh, it was copy settings. Okay, so that's Command-Shift-C or Control-Shift-C. Let me go back over here, and I'm going to change this from its default, which is display toggle, to keystroke. I'm going to hit command shift C or Control Shift C, and we're just gonna. I'll just shorten it and say copy, and then let's select this one down here, keystroke. And what was the paste? Probably B. B, right? Just, like, B. just yeah. like every other command paste B. command. Command Shift B. <laughs> Control <laughs> Shift B, and we'll just go paste. Spell it right, of course. <laughs> Click OK. You never. Uh, you can never spell something correctly in a demo. That's never. Right. Never at all. All right, so let's see here. Uh, as I jump back over to Lightroom, I'm going to hover my finger, actually touch one of the buttons. You can see where it highlights and says copy, and then this other one down here that says paste. So let's go over to the image that I had made some adjustments. You can kind of see a little bit of the adjustments here. This is a, one of the other images in the seri series. A little lack in contrast. This one's got a little bit more, you know, just for kicks because I like to add globally. No, nope, not that. Let me get out of the adjustment brush. There we go, and let's just drag this clarity slider up quite a bit here. And now I'm going to go ahead and hit the express key that says copy, and it'll bring up my dialog box. Do I really want to copy all this stuff? Yes. We'll go over here to the next one, and then we'll go ahead and click the other express key, and we'll see what happens to it. There we go. So not too bad right there. So, awesome. Now that, that particular one brought up um, uh, that particular keystroke. What did, it, what did that do differently here? You did well, all settings, so that was that was. Uh, See, that's funny here. Now I looked at this. Without choosing. And said, What's with the shift? Command that, C. That, that just does it. If you just do Command C, it brings up the menu to allow you to choose the settings. No, that's what that's what I applied here. Command Shift C. Oh, that's Command Shift C. Yeah, but then Command C appears to do the, the same, same thing. thing. Okay, so what what did I miss? Something here. Interesting. Maybe Adobe just threw in that extra shift for fun. Shift just for <laughs> I don't know. 
But anyway, because yeah, I don't use the shift. Just... Yeah. So, well, the, the point here is that you, you want to think about those keystrokes that require more than one key make the most sense to apply to your express keys, those physical buttons on the side right there. But uh, anyway, so that was that was kind of what I wanted to show there. Cool. But um, that's that. Excellent. Can I can I show one thing real quick? I just remembered. It was, yeah, go for it. Give me a real quickie. Unless you guys have to run. You bet. And while you answer that, let me let me answer Sam's question over here. That about the the uh, of course the Bayer filter is across the sensor in the camera. I don't know. Talking about gels made me think it was a, a filter for a light, but of course it's the it's the anti-aliasing filter in the camera, right? And um, I don't think that's what's affecting the the color problems in there, Sam. I think I think he says that that your sensor has two green for each red and blue photo site, and with the purity of the LED lights, it seems to leave holes in the data when trying to make adjustments. And let's change that word purity to uh, whiteness of the, of the LED lights. And and I think what what you're actually missing here, Sam, is is a high CRI in those lights, and that's color rendition index. And so the higher the color rendition index, the more color is included in the light. And what we see with, with some LED lights is that they have a lot of blue and they don't include a lot of the red. And that, that leaves you lacking certain colors in the light um, when, you're, when you're doing it. Do you guys have any input on that? <laughs> I'll go with what you said. <laughs> have any input on that? I, I was just going to say, wow, this conversation turned radically <laughs> around. <laughs> not my intelligence level. So. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll just look for some higher CRI <laughs> LEDs. Maybe I'll head out with Sam in the morning. Yeah, and, do that. Uh, and see see what we can shoot. Report back on our next hangout, okay? Uh, I would concur, Levi. Yes. <laughs> I concur. You're spot on there. <laughs> All, right, All right, take it away, Rob. Right. So the last thing I wanted to show was uh, how to add color that's not there. Um, and I'm using the adjustment brush. I'd already turn that on, so here's my little brush. Um, and so this is a scene out on Monhegan Island in Maine. It's a really cool place. In the spring, all these are all lupin flowers yeah. uh, blooming everywhere, and then these artists come out and paint these scenes, and then photographers come and take pictures of the painters. <laughs> you know? It's a pretty cool thing. But uh, her umbrella here had, has a little bit of purple in it, but you know it kind of got a little overexposed, and that didn't really come through. So I wanted to add just a little bit of color in here um, and I wanted to do that using the adjustment brush and also to use this feature called auto mask. When Excellent. auto mask is checked as I brush as long as my crosshair stays over the umbrella part I can make my brush even bigger and the adjustment will, all, will be constrained to just on the umbrella just the pixels that match under the crosshair. All right? And I, turn, I press the O key to turn the mask on I usually, like, I usually like to first. That way I can see what's being brushed or not and not have and have all my adjustments zeroed out. I don't really care right now. I just want to know that I'm covering the umbrella and I'm not really concerned about what adjustments are being applied. So right. once I know the umbrella is there and nothing else is, then I'll press O to turn that ad adjustment off. And then what I'll do is I'll turn saturation all the way down and then come down here to the color swatch and I want to pick a color, all right? And I, I can drag around, and we can see the umbrella is changing a little bit there. But what if I want to get some color from this nice lupin or maybe her hat in here? Oh, yeah. If I click in the color swatch and just drag right out, now I'm sampling from the photo. And if you look in the color swatch, see how it's going? Looks like it's going crazy. It's, it's showing the color underneath the cursor as I'm dragging around here. All right, and so I can maybe choose a purple here, and now I can control if I want it more or less saturated. All right, so now I've got my color loaded in. Now I'll just maybe turn down the exposure on that a little bit so that we see the color a little bit more. And so now I can, you know, just very quickly with the adjustment brush, um, take the color that might have been there out and then adjust by just adding in a color, choosing the color right from the image itself, from anywhere. I could have made it green if I wanted to. And then playing with exposure to make that color a little bit appear more saturated or not. Excellent. And then 
get out of the brush. That's that's all I wanted to show. Cool okay. tip. Well, so, uh, we got through all our questions. We got through our hour. Anyone, any last, any last things to share before we wrap up? I think that's that's uh, that's it. Pretty good. It's a wrap. So, Wes, wrap. If, I, I appreciate how much we we learned about the tablet in this. Uh, if I wanted to know more, where could I go to learn more? Excellent question. Well, you can uh, you can always uh, check out Wacom.com, www.wacom.com. Uh, we have uh, uh, we all sorts of different events that we travel to all around the country. Uh, we do uh, webinars all the way around. Taking off, uh, taken off the, taken off the really, really, really some webinars, but webinars, but we're series up, series up uh, very shortly. Uh, very you can go to Wacom.com to find that. Actually, what you want to do is go to community.wacom.com. Uh, where we've got uh, a number of different things that are going on there. You can follow us on the blog. Uh, obviously, Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Wacom. Uh, Twitter, same thing, twitter.com slash Wacom. Uh, I forget exactly what our G Plus address is. I'm going to go ahead and guess it's Wacom, but uh, you want to check that out there. Uh, as far as myself and, and some of the different things that we're working on, uh, you can find me on G Plus, and gosh, I should really know this. Uh, I, I always get my G plus and my Twitter and, and, and Facebook all mixed up, but it's I believe it's just WestonMaggio.com, or excuse me, Weston Maggio on G plus, and on Twitter it is uh, Weston underscore Maggio, I believe, or flip flop those. So either way, you'll be able to find me there. So, anyways, that's where you can find uh, out a little bit more about Wacom, our products, and myself, and where we're at. Excellent. Hey, Rob, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. I muted you because we were getting some Cylon action going on. Off your microphone and speakers. Oops. Sorry. Wait, uh, unmute, one, uh, more unmute one more time. There you go. Uh, yeah, sorry. Turn, turn down your volume. Your volume. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, so hopefully you can hear me. I turned it all the way off. Um, I, I want to say if you're a Kelby One subscriber, uh, Wes just came out with a class on Kelby One. That's all about using the Wacom with. Uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, and uh, it's an excellent class. So uh, go check that out. You're already paying for it. Go check it out. If you're not a subscriber, that might be a good incentive for you to to go give it a shot. It's a uh, it's an excellent class. It goes right from soup to nuts. Everything you want to know is is all covered in there. Nice nicely done. So excellent. Excellent. Well, and where are you, Rob? Where are you, Rob? Ah, uh, so I am uh, heading off to Tetons tomorrow. Uh, digital photo, the digital photo workshops .com, and you can see our trips. Um, we've got Moab uh, two weeks from now. We'll be down in Arches and uh, Canyonlands, and then next year we're working on a calendar for next year. We'll have we've got Yosemite for sure. We're thinking uh, Old Car City and uh, Death Valley, and somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Excellent. We'll we have to figure that out. We've got, we're very lucky. We've got some super guest instructors, Brian Matthias and Nicole Young, and my buddy Randy and I. So we've got a lot of good things coming up. And uh, maybe Wes will come again. Uh, and uh, Levi will see you in Tetons, and maybe we'll see you in Moab too. So, so but what about you, Levi? Where can we find you these days? Uh, you can find me on, uh, on, Twitter, on Twitter, on Facebook, and. Uh, also on photofocus.com. And we've got a cruise coming up with Skip Cohen University in January. And this is the best thing on the planet. We're, we're taking a cruise in the Western Caribbean. And the way a cruise works is that you're on the ship for a few days going two places. And then you get there and you can go do things off the boat. Well, those, those times on the boat, we've got a photo conference going on with some of the best portrait instructors in the world. We've got Michelle Celentano, um, Justin and Mary Morantz, and then also Bobby Lane and Lee Veris teaching us uh, commercial and, and uh, Photoshop. It's going to be incredible, and it's pretty darn affordable as well. And so head over to scuwinterbreak.com, or excuse me, scuwinterbreak slash squarespace.com, and check out that cruise. We'd love to have you along. Very cool. Well, thanks, guys, for hanging out for another hour. Uh, this will be archived and appear on the site very soon along with all our past hangouts so if you came in late you can watch the, the archive version and see it from the beginning 
Cool. Watch it over and over and over again. All right, take good care. Thanks, guys.